So I'd like to talk a little bit about fossils, and here's the kind of place you can find fossils in, a dry environment. Um, they can occur anywhere, but it's easier to find them in places that are exposed, they don't have a lot of vegetation, um, and that have preserved them for, for a long period of time. Let's talk about uh, fossils and, and what they are. Um, so here's an example, a great example of a uh, fossil. This is a trilobite, um, and fossils are any trace of uh, past life. Um, so they can be bones or um, where the minerals in the bone have been replaced by um, uh, inorganic miner minerals. Um, they can be molds of the exterior of an object, like if you can kind of imagine a shell that's been compacted in clay and then you open up the clay, it'd be a mold of the, uh, of the object inside that clay. Or they can even be impressions um, from things like footprints or even leaves in, in material. Um, so they can have, um, almost any organism can, can be fossilized. Here we have a stingray that has a lot of soft parts. Um, the softest parts of the body have not been preserved. Um, they don't really have bones. They have kind of a cartilaginous um, skeleton, and uh, which usually is not preserved, but here it's been preserved in this really nice example. Um, so the actual pieces that get preserved in a fossil and that make it through fossilization um, can vary with even within an organism. Um, here's an ammonite shell, curling in words. The exterior looks like it's what's been preserved here. These are crinoids, um, and, and so usually the, these small stalks are made of many discs that are stacked, and sometimes it's only these stacked discs that are found, um, and sometimes it's, it's almost the whole body. <clears throat> here's a really interesting one. It's, it's, it's kind of a poor fossil in some ways. You can, I think you can see a uh, backbone here and some legs and a tail. This is a tadpole that's been preserved in really nicely um, fine-grained, um, uh, low-energy environment. Um, you get kind of an outline of the whole animal. So the, the you know, soft parts of the body have not been preserved um, in any detail, but they are still kind of recorded in this, in this um, in the sediment. Uh, and here's a praying mantis trapped in amber. Uh, amber is fossilized tree sap. Um, and um, so this counts as a fossil also, even though it's not, it hasn't been turned into rock or isn't recorded in a rock. Um, so lots of different kinds of, uh, of uh, things can be fossilized, including animals or plants or, or anything else. So now um, I just want to talk about a couple of different pretty interesting uh, uh, fossil species. Uh, so let's talk about um, this one here. This is Cyanornithosaurus, Cyanornith is a small feathered dinosaur. Here's a reconstruction of the, or, or a listing of the, um, uh, bones that have been found, the skeletal uh, fossilized bones that have been found. And here's a reconstruction of what that animal may have looked like in life. Um, and uh, so each one of these pictures shows a different um, specimen. Um, and, and so this here is this guy over here. Uh, there, the, this specimen is sometimes called Dave. Um, so it's a very um, highly detailed um, fossil. So we don't just see the skeleton. Right, we can see a lot of the soft parts, including the outlines of the, of the skin and and uh, flesh of the body, uh, and and you can also see uh, feathers um, coming out of it. So dinosaurs are uh, birds are a type of dinosaur. Um, this is a, this is not a bird. This is a early kind of feathered dinosaur. Um, uh, something along the way to the uh, along the line towards birds. Um, so it still has a long tail, unlike a bird. It still has free fingers three fingers, not just three, but three fingers. Um, in birds, the fingers are fused together. And uh, so you can see lots of things going on here. You can even see some of the, maybe some of the internal organs. Uh, so these are some specimens of Archaeopteryx um, from the late Jurassic. Sometimes Archaeopteryx is called the Ur-Vogel, or the first bird. So people used to make a big deal about distinguishing between dinosaurs and birds, and it was thought that Archaeopteryx was um, just a bird, um, not a type of dinosaur. Now, we, now we know these things are are are, are the same, and that birds evolved from from the dinosaurs. So here's some a few different specimens of Archaeopteryx. Um, there aren't that many of them. Some are are very close to complete. And here you can see the body, um, the, the 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 wings, the feathers that make up the wings. You can still see it has a long bony tail. It doesn't have a beak like a modern bird does. Um, here the feathers. Are, are much less obvious, and here you just have uh, uh, one of the one of the arms. It's just, it's just a chicken wing of the uh, of the fossil for, that's been preserved. Um, now, when you have more than one specimen, more than one individual, you can start doing something like uh, modern biology, right? So here we have all uh, of the different or many of the different um, Archaeopteryx uh, individuals. 
and there are some measurements and estimates of the body mass, the body size. And uh, by looking at the bones, they can come up with these, these estimates of body size. So they can look at the thickness of, of the leg bones or the arm bones and kind of um, compare that to other birds and um, uh, get an estimate for how big uh, the animal was. And they can also look at it at, at the um, fine details of the, of the fossilized bone and get an estimate of the age of the individual. And so what you have here now is a curve that shows you um, age and body size. So you have a curve that shows you um, growth rates for this specimen. So this is a non-living animal. Um, we can't watch it grow. We only have dead individuals of it. Um, but we can reconstruct and estimate uh, things like growth rate. And we can see that they grew uh, more quickly as they were young and that their growth rate leveled off. So this is not, this is kind of an estimate of growth rate. You have to do a little more work to really get that. But the point is you can do, um, you, you can do more than just collect and catalog fossils. You can actually um, do, do modern biology on them. Oops. Um, so here's a uh, paleo artist's reconstruction of Archaeopteryx. It's about crow, a crow-sized animal, and here it looks kind of like a, like a crow. Um, a really great um, reconstruction by an artist named Louis V. Ray. Uh, now here is another um, uh, type of dinosaur called a Spinosaurus, and this is also a great artist's reconstruction. And um, so Spinosaurus um, is known to have primarily eaten fish. And so we can collect the bones of it, and we can look at the environment that those bones were found in. Maybe they were found with um, uh, plants that are associated with the shoreline. Um, but we can also get the bones, and we can look at the isotopes that are present in those bones and the ratio of different isotopes. And when we look at that, we see that, uh, that uh, um, Spinosaurus ate primarily fish, almost exclusively fish. And that's, we can know that because the fish were living in water that had a particular isotopic signature. And so the water imparted its signature to the fish. The fish were then eaten by the Spinosaurus, and then they carried that isotopic signature with them. Um, and so we are able to um, reconstruct the animal's diet from its fossils. So we don't just get at the form of the animal, but we can get into its, its metabolism, its biology, and all kinds of aspects of its life. Um, a kind of so this is done by an artist named um, uh, David Bonadonna. Um, really great um, illustration here. So this is an organism that we know or that we suspect now um, didn't wasn't primarily terrestrial. It spent a lot of time in the water, and so that wasn't known for a long time. We've known, we've had specimens of of spinosaurs um, since I think the 40s, 1940s, uh, but it's only the last couple of years that we've put forward this idea. And so I think you know whenever when I'm talking about stuff here. We have the fossil forms, and then we have some ideas that often are expressed by paleo artists, um, and, 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 or at least best expressed by paleo artists that are picked up from a study of those bones. Um, so the scientists do the work, the paleo artists don't come up with these ideas on their own, obviously, um, and, and they can incorporate this into um, this artwork that really gets the idea across. So um, we know about what Spinosaurus ate because of isotopic work on them. People have also, researchers have also done isotopic work on humans. And so um, it's a method that can be used to tell what humans in different locations um, in, in an anthropological context uh, have been eating. So not surprisingly, humans that lived along the coast uh, often had a isotopic signature that suggested they were eating fish and clams and, and things like that. Um, whereas uh, species, um, groups of humans that lived uh, farther inland had a, had a different isotopic signature. Um, by looking at things like uh, a human's tooth enamel in, in fossil humans, um, they've been able to determine where an individual spent most of its life. And that's because these isotopic signals, they vary with different latitudes and different locations on the Earth. Um, so they can see that if a person was found, if a fossil was found in one area, it might not have the same isotopic signature um, that that location should have. They might have came from many uh, hundreds of miles away. Um, so these are geological methods that are used uh, in a wide variety of the other sciences too. So geochemistry and um, uh, these kind of geoscience tools are used not just by geologists to look for rocks and oil or things like that. They're used by biologists, they're used by anthropologists, they're used by all kinds of, all kinds of researchers. Um, so here is a couple of different images. So here we have a uh, fossil of Deinonychus. This is at the American Museum of Natural, Hist Natural History, right in New York. And um, so it's... it's um, you know, presented in a particular pose, and that pose is speculative, and it was done in part with the work of paleo artists. And here is a um, reconstruction of this animal done by this, the 
um, paleontologist, the um, uh, person that collects and studies fossils, um, that discovered it, uh, a person named John Ostrom. And uh, so he did this um, unusual, so you can see here, the animal has a pose. It's not just standing flat or still, it, and it's shown as, as a running, and as an agile, as a light and active organism. And um, this is at a time when people thought, that, thought of most dinosaurs as very slow and lumbering um, kind of animals. Uh, so paleo art really makes a big difference for how we um, uh, convey our messages about science too. Now on the other side, we have another reconstruction by uh, this artist again, Louis V. Ray, of the, of the same, same animal, Deinonychus. And, but he's, you know, we don't know, he's uh, about soft tissue structures in Deinonychus. So here we have something that's kind of like what you see in, in a turkey or a chicken. Uh, here we have more feathers being shown. Um, and so it, it's speculative and we have to speculate. Um, quite a bit in order to understand uh, uh, these animals. And sometimes those speculations are shown to be, be correct. Um, here's another really great uh, piece of paleo art. It's showing a uh, velociraptor, which is a smallish animal, chasing down a uh, primitive mammal called a Zandelestes, uh, Zalandestes. And um, it's done by an artist named Mark Witten. And so this is a very lifelike um, pose. In the previous picture, you know, animals don't pose for us for photos. And, and, and strike these kinds of um, uh, these kind of poses, right? Um, in, in real life, they're they're moving quite differently, and so this looks like a scene that you can see from from Life Anywhere. Uh, these are also some reconstructions done by the same paleo artist, and this is a paleo artist that's very informed by the science and very familiar with the fossils, and um, the, the the range of motions that are implied by the fossils. And so here we have a type of pterosaur. Uh, I believe these ones are as darkids, and um, He's showing them walking on the ground. And we know that some of them were very large and um, could certainly f fly, but maybe didn't spend all of their time flying. Just like some birds today spend a lot of time on the ground. Some birds today spend a lot of time on the ground. Pterosaurs, of course, are not birds, not dinosaurs. They're their own, own organisms. So these are some stalking as darkids eating the juvenile uh, dinosaurs. And they could be as large as a giraffe. Um, so um, you know, the fossils themselves are, are amazing. And then uh, our scientific understanding of them can really give us insight into these past worlds. Um, so um, here is a uh, collection of New York State fossils. So the New York State fossil, kind of like the symbol, uh, the fossil associated with our state, the official state fossil is Eurypterus remipes, which is a type of um, sea scorpion. Um, some of them are very large, some of them are very relatively small. Um, this is an organism that lived in the Silurian around 400 million years ago. And so New York State is made up of rocks that were once at the bottom of an ocean. So this is not a land animal. This is not an actual scorpion. It's called a sea scorpion. It's, it's, it's um, an extinct species that lived in the, in the ocean. Um, and so here's a location where you can find a lot of these fossils. And sometimes, um, you know, so in New York, we can, you can find fossils. It's, you don't have to go out to the, to the west in the desert in order to find them, right? Um, so here are some more uh, pictures of from the same people, um, we have some fossil trilobites, some really small ones here, another another one here, and here's a location which they were found. And so you can you can see here that this river is passing through this stream and it's eroding away the rocks. And some of these fossils are being lost over time. Other ones are being exposed by the river at the edge, uh, and that's where they can be picked up. Um, so in New York, we find um, eurypterids, sea scorpions, trilobites. We find lots of fossil corals, mollusks, all kinds of things like that. Um, not too many dinosaur, so not any dinosaur fossils really. In New York. This is a specimen, this is a type of fossil um, called Coralator. It's the only dinosaur fossil associated with New York. It's not a bone fossil, it's an imprint fossil. So we believe that this is produced by a dinosaur. It's a footprint. Um, so just like fossil bones are given a name, uh, kind of uncontroversially, you find a skeleton of an animal, you give that animal a name. We do the same thing with fossil footprints. We give the footprint a name. So this is a, and they get a genus and species name. And so this is a footprint belonging to the genus Growlator. There is no skeleton also named Growlator. Um, so um, we don't know the track maker, so we have to name just the tracks. And so it's thought that uh, uh, Growlator, especially in New York, is made by a small dinosaur called Coelophysis. Um, so these tracks and traces, they're also really important because they tell us something that um, fossils, other types of fossils don't really tell us. Um, they show the actual behavior of the animal. So these are two isolated footprints. You can imagine if you have multiple footprints, if you have an entire track way, you can make estimates of the, the, the speed at which an animal is moving, if you know how long the legs are and how far apart the steps were. 
Um, uh, there are cases where we have uh, predator and prey animals that seem to be interacting, being hunted. So we've captured hunting and those kind of things. There's even certain tr fossil traces that um, are thought to be uh, produced by animals swimming, uh, tail swipes and drags and even tiptoed um, uh, movement through, through uh, rivers and mud. So, so actual behavior can be recorded with this. Now, um, so those, that's all really cool and neat. Uh, I think it's, you know, really cool and neat. Um, but so uh, we have some more um, uh, other kind of um, practical uses for, um, uh, from fossils. So the fossils that I just showed you are, are things like, like the skeletons of dinosaurs and things like that. Um, but we also have fossilized um, plankton. Plankton are small, um, sometimes microscopic, sometimes visible um, uh, organisms that float in the oceans. Um, and so something like a jellyfish is, is, is kind of planktonic and floats around in the ocean. And there's, there's other animals that do that and, and other plants that do it. Algae is a plankton. Um, so shown here are some things called foraminifera, um, which produce these hard shells. And then there's a soft body that goes around it. So they're not, they don't live inside the shell like, like you would with a normal shell. In fact, these are called tests, not shells. But so the, the point here is that um, there's lots of different types of, of, of fossils. And some of them can be very small and widespread. And um, they can tell us a lot about the rock that are found, they are found in. Um, so the study of um, fossils and how they relate to rock strata, how they're used to, to correlate rock strata over places, is called biostratigraphy. <clears throat> and so in biostratigraphy, we might have a first occurrence and then a last occurrence datum or first occurrence and last appearance point. Um, that gives us a range over which the animal is known to have existed. And when you have multiple animals that have, where we have the known first and last occurrences, you can have a set of overlapping ranges. And so when you find all of these particular species together in a rock, you know that you're in this formation or that formation. So that, that can be relatively important for, uh, for, for, for doing academic work or also for especially um, uh, oil and the oil and gas industry. Um, so not just for identifying um, uh, so the oil company doesn't use this just to identify which, which rocks to drill, um, but they might even use it for something called bio-steering. Um, so this is a, a technique where, so in this picture, you have an oil drilling rig, and then they extend the oil drill down through the rock, and they're able to, to kind of manipulate and turn that, um, that drill bit. And when they reach, so as they drill through the rock, they're getting samples that get brought back up um, to the rig, and those samples are then examined by a, a, a geologist on the, um, on the rig who's working as a biostratigrapher. And they'll look through the rock, they'll identify the rock minerals, they'll tell you what type of rock it is, and then they'll start looking at the fossils that are present. And again, these are, in this kind of case, they're not large bones of dinosaurs, right? They're, they're small bones, they're small fossils of, of plankton and things like that. <clears throat> and so as they drill through, they'll eventually reach the um, rock strata of interest. And then the fossils that they're interested in will, will start preparing them. And so biostratigraphy tells them when they've reached the layer that they're interested in, which is the layer that has oil, right? Or is trapping the oil. And these layers are horizontal, right? They go, they're, they're flat and run across, but the drill bits are going down, right? Uh, so they can use this biosteering technique, this ability to manipulate the, the drill bits in order to um, keep it moving horizontally through the rock that they're interested in drilling. And it's, the, it's through the biostratigraphy that they're able to stay there. Um, the, the, you know, the physics is of, of moving the drill bit is one thing, but it's, it's biostratigraphy that allows them to do bio-steering, to steer that thing, that drill bit, through the rock that they're interested in. And if they move out of it, it takes time to get back into it. And if they move out of it through the bottom, it takes time to get back in again. And so, you know, time can be, can be important, can be a lot of money on these kind of projects. So bio-steering is a really important technique um, used in the oil and gas industry. It's an example of how fossils are used um, for not just academic purposes, but for practical purposes. But they also have academic uses too. So here's um, uh, a place where, uh, well, so f here's a diagram showing some different uh, environments. And you can kind of imagine that if we find a tropical animal, um, then we can expect that the environment was tropical. So in, in England, they find in, in old rock strata uh, fossils of crocodiles and hippos, which are not present in England now at all. Um, so the environment was once uh, uh, tropical and very wet, right, for hippos and crocodiles, right, unlike it is today. Um, we find um, tropical species of coral in New York. So in the past, we know that this was once a shallow, warm water place, right, kind of like the Caribbean is today. Um, so we can identify environments just in general in very vague terms through uh, the study of fossils. 
We can also do this in a finer scale. So here you have not um, differentiating between you know, the tropics and the polar regions, um, but you have position along a beach face. And so there's different fauna and animals, organisms that live in different parts of a beach face. And um, so you, we have some that live in, in, in the, the cliffs up above the beach. We have some that live right in the low water and in intertidal zones. And we have a different set of animals that live further out you go into deeper and deeper waters. So we can look at an area, at the fossils in an area, and decide where along a coastline it was. We can also then look at one layer. And we can look at a more recent layer and see if there's been any shift in those positions. So maybe on day one, you know, in layer one, we find organisms that live in the intertidal zone. And then in the higher layer, we find organisms that live out on the shelf. So we know that there's been a, the water's gotten much deeper over time here, right? Um, so we can keep track of rising sea level at a location using um, uh, a study of the fossils. And so this has all kinds of important um, uh, places it can branch off into um, that I don't want to necessarily get into. Um, just wanted to talk a little bit about, about these fossils. Um, so it'd be kind of remiss to not look at a fossil. So let's try this. Okay, so here I have a um, fossil dinosaur bone. And you can, I think, see this is the um, overall shape of this one. I guess that, that video is a little bit blurry. Um, but so this is a thigh bone from a Triceratops in Montana. And you can see on the outside, it, ha it has a, a surface that looks very much like bone. Um, so not, not surprising because it is fossilized bone. It's where the um, skeletal material, the minerals that make up your bones and its, its bones, um, these calcium phosphate minerals, um, ha have been replaced by the local rock. So all of the original material is gone, but it's been it, on the microscopic level replaced with um, inorganic minerals and preserved. And you can kind of see inside of here now, I think that looks actually pretty good. Uh, maybe we can focus a little more. You can see inside this bone. So there's an exterior layer to the bones. And then there's an interior core to this bone. And we have, I think this is called cancellous bone or something like that. And then here we have um, a bone that contains marrow and things like that deeper in this large, long limb bone. Uh, and if we had, uh, if we had sectioned this and maybe used a microscope, we could see the individual um, uh, chambers and cells of this um, of this bone, right? And we can get some ideas about maybe how old this animal is, and um, uh, how how long it lived, or if there are anything else in its life that happened to it. So um, nothing, you know, amazing there, but just a little one little actual fossil in, in addition to these pictures that we were just looking at. Um, so yeah, these uh, these fossils found in places again like this. Um, this looks similar to where. Um, that that Triceratops fossil was found. Um, these are the kind of places that you can find find fossils. You can also find them in places like New York, um, and they can tell us a lot about past life, and um, they can inform us a lot about the history of an area and how it's changed over over geological time. Uh, so I think we'll end end with that.